In the last lecture we talked about money, and I made the argument that monetary units are the backbone of most economic systems, and that is certainly true. But what you also need are payment systems. You need them to send money from A to B. Now, I know you're familiar with these payment systems from a user perspective. I mean, uh, every one of you has already used credit cards, I assume. Uh, you have already paid your bills with a bank transfer. But you probably are not aware of the standards that are out there and why in some cases these payments can be really expensive and slow and in some cases they're quite fast. So we're really going to take a look at the different categories and the standards in this space. All right, uh, when we talk about payment systems, the third thing you have to talk about is cash payments. And I can tell you cash payments usually get underestimated a lot because they're quite simple and um, they don't seem exciting whatsoever, but they have some really nice properties. But let's start at the beginning. With a cash payment, it's quite easy. You have a, a buyer and a seller. So uh, this guy here, that would be the buyer, this would be the seller. The seller obviously sells some goods or services to the buyer and the buyer would pay in cash. And this works fine. Uh, it's something we economists refer to as immediate settlement because at no point in time there would be any credit. It's uh, exactly when you, when you deliver the good, uh, you also uh, deliver the cash. And uh, that way it's, it, there is no trust required, there is no credit. Um, um, that, that gets initiated, and that's a really nice property of cash payments. Now, of course, uh, cash also has some drawbacks, and uh, the most apparent drawback is well, when you uh, have buyers and sellers that aren't in uh, immediate proximity. So let's say, for example, you have somebody who's selling something in the US, and then you have somebody who's buying something in Switzerland, or even when they are in the same country, but it's really a trade that is conducted via the internet, so an, an online shop then cash might not be the most useful payment variant. I mean, how would you transfer the cash? You could, of course, have a shipment container or you could, you could mail it, but it's really um, leads to a lot of transaction costs and there is some time delay. So the nice property of this immediate settlement would immediately break down. And the other thing, also a nice property of cash, uh, the one that you don't need any infrastructure, also would break down, okay? So that's that's certainly an option in the age of the internet and the, in the age of e-commerce. So one really naive approach um, you could go with is say, let's just replicate that cash payment uh, in an electronic form and say, for example, that the central bank, uh, let's go with the Swiss National Bank, they could just issue Swiss franc files or uh, the Fed could issue US dollar files and you, you would have this PDF, right, that is signed by the central bank and then you could send it as an email attachment as an example. Hmm? Okay, so you, whenever I, I buy something, so, so this guy right here uh, would simply take the cash file signed by the central bank, uh, attach it to an email and send it to the seller over here. Now, of course, there is a huge problem because whenever you have a, a file, whenever you have any digital data um, whatsoever, it doesn't really matter what exactly it is, uh, you can easily copy it. So you can copy and paste it. And this guy right here really has no way of telling how many copies of this cache file exist and to how many people the buyer has actually uh, shipped or sent this, this, this cache file. And that's a big issue. And that's essentially the reason why all of our payment systems are established in an indirect way with, with a large number of intermediaries in between. So whenever you have somebody who's selling something, like again, the seller over here, selling good or service, then the payment goes in the form of a payment order to an intermediary uh, and uh, the buyer as well as the seller, they have accounts with this intermediary of one of the correspondence uh, banks with one of the other intermediary, intermediaries in this network. And what then happens is in the centralized way, this guy right here simply adjusts the account balances for the buyer and for the seller and makes sure that each and every monetary unit only gets spent once. So that essentially is the centralized way to solve this double spending issue that you would have in a system where you have a cache file and where everyone could just uh, copy and paste the cache file as many times as they want. Okay, so this works really great in, in the, in the um, Western world and 
in a, in a modernized world, it works perfectly well, especially when there are great institutions and trustworthy institutions. Uh, now, whenever there is a higher degree of corruption, let's say, whenever there is a, a risk that the institutions don't necessarily work that great, then this is a highly risky system. Also, when you have instability in a, from a political point of view, and the risk that, let's say, a government or a president could influence these these guys right here. Uh, you have a risk of expropriation. You have a risk of censorship. You have several risks that would be really bad in these systems. Okay, but even in a world where um, this works fine, where you have no such risk, it's still in a, a, a severe single point of failure. If if something happens to this infrastructure right here, if there is a, a critical error, if if the infrastructure better breaks down, or really anything like that then essentially the entire payment system of that economy would shut down, which would be really, really bad. I mean, that's a severe issue. And it happened before in not large scale, but for for a, a limited geographic area and for a limited period of time. This happened even in Switzerland a few years back. Um, and it ha usually happens once or twice a year. And it has major implications, but since it is really limited to the geographic area and to a really short time frame, um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's bad and it's embarrassing if you have no cash and you want to pay with card and it's not working, but it has no major uh, economic implications. But if you think of the hypothetical future where there are no cash payments, where everything has to go through these networks, and then you would have a critical failure, that would be really bad. I can tell you if it's if it's for an extended period of time. So let's say a day or two days or three days, and there would be no other options. So you really cannot buy anything. That would probably lead to anarchy quite quick, quite quickly. I mean, imagine uh, an economy where nobody would be able to buy anything um, for a certain amount of time. So yes, uh, even in these systems, even when it works quite well, even if, if you have a um, limited risk of somebody expropriating, of somebody censoring, even then there are good your arguments that this is somewhat risky and that a more decentralized system would pro probably be a better fit. And essentially, as you will see, of course, this is a segue to Bitcoin, but we will take some steps in between. Now. What you have to know about these systems, there's really two types. There is an implicit, so that's verbal agreements. So when you, when you don't explicitly write it down, but you just talk to your friends um, and have this agreement that uh, A owes something to B and B owes something to C and so on. Uh, and this is really limited to small groups and uh, a trusted relationship or an established relationship. It's certainly not going to work on a global scale because you, s you simply cannot uh, keep in mind every everything and there would be no way to reach an agreement in such a form. There are also explicit ledgers and these are explicit records in a written form or in a, in a digital ledger of what's going on. And essentially all of these payment systems we talk about right here on the large scale and the global scale are explicit records. Now, I want to briefly mention an example of an implicit ledger. So they didn't write it down, they just kept it in their, in their head and had an idea, an understanding, a common understanding of who owns what. And that's the YUP system. And YUP um, is really a, an island in uh, German Micronesia. So that's approximately in between Japan and Australia. And uh, a researcher, William Henry Furness III, visited this island at the beginning of the 20th century. He studied these islanders and wrote down their culture and exactly how they live. And the one thing that's most striking, at least to me as a monetary economist, is their monetary system. These Yop islanders, they use these millstone, the ray stone, as their monetary unit. And just to give you some context, we're really talking about limestones with a diameter of up to four meters. So that's twice the, the size of an adult, of a really large adult that is, okay? So gigantic stones, highly impractical, of course not efficient at all to transfer, but that's what they used in their payment system. That was their form of conducting payments. Now I said limestone. Uh, what you don't know is that on Yop there is no limestone, okay? So what they did is they built these little canoes paddled 450 kilometers to the west on a different island called Palau, 
There they carved out these millstones, put them back on the canoe, paddled back to Yop, and there these monetary units, these stones, these ray stones could circulate with big air quotes as the monetary unit. And of course, again, circulating is a big word here because once you put it somewhere, once you set it somewhere, it was hardly movable, okay? Now, these Yop Islanders, they had a great idea. They realized that once these stones are on Yop, it doesn't really matter where they're located. It doesn't really matter if they're in my backyard or your backyard, and we don't even have to transfer them when I'm paying you. They can remain in my backyard as long as, long as we do realize, as long as we all know that these stones, that this particular stone now actually belongs to you, it's all fine. So what I have to do is, whenever I transfer a stone, whenever I receive a good and service, and I transfer the stone, I'm not actually going to move the stone, but I rather communicate to everyone on this island that this particular stone that is in my backyard now belongs to someone else. And then you have this gossip ongoing until everyone knows that this stone has a new owner. As you will see later on, and we will get back to this, this has actually a lot in common with Bitcoin. There are obviously some differences, major differences, and Bitcoin is much more complicated, particularly because it's a larger group there, it's a global scale payment system. But in essence, Bitcoin works quite similarly. Now, a funny side note, I, I, ha I have to tell you that. It's, it's a great story. Um, in some cases, even when the stone, the ray stone, fell from the canoe when they when they paddled back from Palau to Yop and sank to the bottom of the ocean. They even kept trading it. So everyone on this island just knew that, hmm, you know, on the bottom of the ocean, uh, there is this Yop stone and it currently is owned by X and Y. So they, they just transferred it, they accept as a payment system, even though they haven't seen it. Okay, so it's really the virtualization of these stones. The physical stone acts as a proxy. There is some work effort. You have to create it and you have to bring some form of proof that it exists. But once it exists, you're not going to move it anymore. It just remains in its position. And what you're really trading is just this virtual ledger entry. And this is an implicit registry because it's not written down. It's just in the minds of the community. There is a common understanding of who owns what. Now, there are two other categories or another dimension where we can evaluate payment systems from. Uh, one, the, the, it's, it's, it's the closed or open loop system. And uh, I'd, start to, I'd like to start with the closed loop system, with closed loop payment systems. So what you have to know with a closed loop payment system is that there is a direct relationship with both, with the payer and the payee. And what's also really important is that there is only a single operator or at least a predefined and really small group of operators okay so it's at one set one rules and what's important is the money cannot move outside of the system so it isn't the system it gets it gets exchanged there but it cannot move somewhere else it's really in there and some examples are merchant issue payment cards um, like um, Amazon, for example, Western Union, then PayPal. Uh, of course, PayPal is also closed. You can make some transfers to bank accounts, but then it's not in the system anymore and you have hefty fees. And then several mobile payment services like M-Pesa is an example that was used in Kenya. So these are these mobile minutes you have probably heard about when people started to trade mobile minutes. And then WeChat, of course, uh, which is also an example of a closed loop payment system. These closed loop payment systems, uh, as I mentioned, um, they are closed, obviously, that's why they're called that way, but they're highly efficient. And that, of course, due to the network effects, they're only gonna work if there is a relatively high number of users. So um, if you're the only one who is using a particular closed loop payment system, uh, it's not gonna work. Um, you, will, you, will, you will not be able to use it because you have no one you can send money to. So. Uh, it's really important, it's critical, system critical for these systems, um, that there is a relatively high number of users. And the other system, the other category, are open loop payment systems. And open loop payment systems, they are 
set up in, in the form of standards, set up in a way that there are some interfaces that they are highly interoperable. And the idea here really is that whenever you pay somebody, um, then it goes through your bank as an example. So you have an account right here with a bank, but the pay doesn't have an account with this bank and maybe in another country. So you may have a border as well, uh, that these two banks may have some form of a relationship. This can be direct, can go through further correspondence banks. But the idea is that your payment gets routed through multiple accounts and multiple bank relationships, multiple intermediaries. Now, of course, this is great because it's highly interoperable, but also it's somewhat complicated as you probably can, can uh, as you probably realize by now. For example, the processing time with all of these settlement steps, with all of these steps in between right here, and this can get much more complicated than what you're seeing right here, uh, can be really high. This can take, in some cases, even weeks to arrive. Then of course the fees, when you wanna, especially when you wanna transfer something to a, a different country, can get really expensive. Uh, network dependencies, so it depends what network you're currently in, it depends on what the other uh, person is saying it depends on whether there is a trusted relationship in between. Uh, so this is also uh, some sort of a problem. And then of course the exception handling costs from time to time it happens that these payments, um, they don't go the route they actually should. Some of the information is lost. Uh, the money doesn't actually arrive. And then it gets really expensive for the bank when they have to uh, check all of this information contact multiple banks, see where it went through. And uh, I mean, it's it's not that common, but when it happens, then it gets really, really expensive because it's these are really uh, single cases where there's no standardized process and you have to go through all uh, these hoops until, until you get the information you need. I can give you an example regarding the processing fees. And this actually happened to me. I, I frequently buy and sell stuff on eBay. And this time I bought something and uh, it was eBay Germany. So uh, I'm, li I'm living in Switzerland. I had to transfer money abroad. And um, as we will see later on, there is a standard in Europe, which is referred to as uh, SIPA, Single European Payment Area. And with a SIPA payment, you have the option that you are, uh, you as the payer, pay for all the fees. So the, the uh, recipient of the payment should receive it with no additional fees whatsoever, okay? That's exactly what I did. I took the amount I owed this person, um, chose the option that I will pay for everything for all the fees. And then uh, a few days later, this person on eBay contacted me and said, hey, I, I just paid 10 euro in fees, in additional fees. Uh, yeah, this is not possible because I told my bank to take care of all the fees I already paid in advance. And then after a while we found out that even though this should not happen, his bank still collected fees since Switzerland is not part of the European Union. Now, SIPA in no way is, is limited to the European Union. Um, it's an EFTA thing, which Switzerland is part of, um, but still, um, they they just just collected this fee and we couldn't do anything about it. Okay, so we de we decided or I offered him that you know what uh, ten euros I'm just going to cover five of them. Uh, so I wanted to send him five euros so that we can split the bill. And then I I tried to find a way to send it to him. Obviously I wasn't going to do the same process because then he would have another ten bucks in fees, which would be ridiculous for a five five euro payment. So what I did is I decided to go with PayPal. So I sent him five bucks, five euro in PayPal. And then PayPal charged me two euro and 79 euro cents for this payment again. So where I'm going with this story and what I want to tell you is that these cross-border payments, they can get really complicated. Even if it's just Switzerland, Germany, they can get really expensive and um, also with SIPA payments, for example, uh, they should be there within three days. It's actually a rule that they should arrive there, but they had several instances where this didn't happen. And also it's really hard to find some general rules because for the exact same payments, it sometimes takes one day, uh, just a few hours, but sometimes it takes two, three, or in some cases even longer than that. 
and that's that's the that's where we are right now with payment systems um, and the, the reason why this is the way it is is because many of these systems also when you look at the core banking systems of the banks when you look at the entire infrastructure when you look at all of these standards these are legacy systems that have been in place for a really long time and people just started building on top of it so uh, the the base infrastructure never really changed i mean in some cases it did but uh, really essentially it's still pretty similar to what it was decades ago and of course it's not state of the art anymore i mean the, the technological capabilities would be much better than this there would be so many more options but once you're locked in in a technology like that once you have these systems in place it's in fact really hard to switch away from them now the standards we have the most important ones are swift of course uh, since the 1970s and SWIFT what you need to know and what you need to understand it's really just a messaging standard okay it's a it's a standard to exchange these messages in a, in a certain format it's not for the settlement the settlement um, is not conducted via SWIFT but it's really the idea that you can exchange the payment relevant notices the payment relevant messages via SWIFT and that's a widely used then you have SEPA right here what I've mentioned earlier uh, it's for the EU and the EFTA. Uh, it's a relatively new standard. It's uh, since 2008, 2009. And uh, the idea is really to mm, get a low cost payment option for Europe. Because obviously there is a lot of trade within the European Union, but also within Europe in general. Uh, and uh, before SEPA, it was even worse to transfer these payments. With SEPA, it got a lot better, but there are still some hiccups, of course. Then you have the credit card networks like Visa, MasterCard, um, and multiple others. And this is really on consumer transactions, of course, the, the focus on the multiple currencies. Um, and I'm, I'm sure all of you have a lot of experience with credit cards. And then you have some um, national payment networks like SIC here in Switzerland, CHIPS, Fedwire, and so on. And the idea is really that they are mainly used nationally. Um, they usually uh, also um, connect to some international standards, to some international payment systems, but they are used for the national exchange of value. Okay, so for the national payments, that's the idea. All right, and this leads to the question: Is Bitcoin a suitable solution to that? And Obviously, since we haven't even touched the technical properties of Bitcoin yet, since we haven't looked into the technology at all, we will not be able to answer that today. But what we can see with certainty is that a physical cash payment system does not meet today's needs. I mean, you have seen that with our uh, doodle examples in the beginning. There are major issues and things you simply cannot settle with cash, with physical cash. Then there are today's digital payment solutions depend on one or several centrally maintained registries and proprietary networks. Um, so there is, in most cases, a single point of failure. There is, in most cases, some dependency on infrastructure, which also has its issues. And then centralized registries and property networks introduce single points of failure. That's what I just said. That's basically that. With the risks I've mentioned earlier, which is manipulation or censorship, which can be really bad, especially when you have weak institutions. So this means, and that's where we circle back to Bitcoin, in fact, and that's why we will uh, also look at Bitcoin from this perspective. This would mean that it could be potentially a desirable solution to combine the efficiency of digitization without dependency on these centralized registries or intermediaries. So this is really the idea, make it more efficient, make it digital, but do not depend on these central institutions. Do not depend on this infrastructure. Uh, basically make it like digital cash. And as you will see in the white paper, and that's actually one of the references and further reading, um, Bitcoin was proposed as an electronic cash system. We will talk about that, whether it succeeded in this regard, and this will be interesting, but the initial idea was that Bitcoin could be a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Now, by the way, this paper, the Bitcoin white paper, if I recall correctly, it's nine pages. And in any case, it's really short. And you should definitely read it. So this isn't just recommended reading. I'd say you really have to do that for this class in order to be able to understand it, in order to set the stage. But there is an additional reading. And this is not for the uh, exam as a, as a side 
remark for the University of Basel students. You don't have to read that, but it still is really interesting, and that is about payment systems in the U.S. It's also a really good book. So that's it for today. Stay curious. See you soon.